This week I was faced with a small dilemma of uh, how to prepare two sermons in a week because um, um, I wanted one for today and one for next week for uh, the Czech Republic. Um, so, so I'm doing the same one. But I'm not quite doing the same one because if, it were, if I was just giving you a practice run of the Czech Republic one, it would be, it's nice to be here. Uh, I haven't seen you in three years and uh, it's lovely to be with you and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, so that bit's different. The rest of it is a rehearsal. <laughs> so, but actually it's fine. Um, uh, I hope it's fine. Um, I want to share one of the experiences, a story of one of the experiences that Paul had. No, not those Pauls. Uh, Paul and Silas had on their second journey, they traveled to the city of Philippi. Now, Philippi was not like the cities that Paul and Silas had already been to. Um, there wasn't a church. Um, there wasn't a synagogue. Obviously, there wasn't a church. Um, there wasn't a synagogue. Um, to, I'm doing what I usually do, which is I have to make the font bigger um, when it comes to the service. Strangely, my eyesight shrinks when I'm uh, standing in front of you. Um, there wasn't a synagogue, and there weren't many believers yet. So Paul and his team went to the edge of the city to find where uh, people had gone to pray down by the river. Um, you all know the song that goes along with that, well, as I went down to the river. No, that's not that one. But uh, they went down to the river and they met Lydia. Uh, Lydia uh, had already become a believer. And so there were very few believers in the town. So let me read the, uh, the scripture, if I may. It's in Acts 16. Starting at verse 16, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. <coughs> she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release these men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. And then we'll end the story there. There is more. But we'll end our story for today there. The story starts with a slave girl who had an evil spirit in her that caused trouble for Paul and his work. So he cast out the demon and the girl became free again and her owners were angry uh, because this young girl made a lot of money by fortune telling. To be fair, what she was saying 
Seems pretty spot on, really. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. So far, so good. So if she was correct in what she was saying, why did Paul interfere? Sounds like free advertising, really, doesn't it? Um, but Paul can not only hear the words she's saying and the message that she's giving, he can discern the Spirit. A gift of the Holy Spirit by which he discerns spirits. And he discerned an evil spirit and cast it out. Because who knows what else she was saying? Who knows the effect that was having uh, on the people around her? Uh, and so Paul and Silas, uh, Paul cast out the demon. And then somebody stopped making lots of money. And there's nothing that riles bad people up than losing their income. And so Paul and Silas were in trouble. The owners grabbed them and went into the city. They reported to the magistrates that they were Jews who were causing trouble promoting practices against the law for Roman citizens. I don't think they knew that Paul was a Roman citizen at that point. They found out later. More people started protesting. <laughs> oh, once a crowd starts going, more people started protesting, even though it didn't affect them. Um, but more people started protesting. And uh, the crowd then uh, agreed with the magistrates. The magistrates are obviously a bit kind of afraid of the crowd ordered Paul and Silas be stripped and beaten severely with sticks. I wrote beaten severely sticks. Is there a mild way to be beaten with sticks? I don't know. They were beaten with sticks. And after the flogging, which is being whipped, so that presumably means they had both. Nice. They were thrown in jail. Always interesting details in the writings of Dr. Luke. <laughs> Why did he? He says that the guard was commanded to guard them carefully. Why did he need to be told to guard them carefully? That was literally his job, guarding people. That was his job. So, so saying to somebody, I want you to do your job carefully here, suggests that the magistrates that knew that there was a bigger picture going on somewhere. Maybe the magistrate was worried about something going wrong. Maybe he'd somehow heard about the guard that had been set over a, a certain tomb a little earlier. And that didn't go well. I don't know. It's an interesting detail. Anyway, one severe beating later, Paul and Silas are thrown into jail with their feet locked in an inner cell. So what would you do? You've been really, for just sharing God's word, you've been, uh, you've been beaten severely with sticks and then thrown into jail, into the inner jail, had your feet all locked up in the stocks, um, what would you do? Say again? Have a cup of tea. Yeah, well, how are you going to make the cup of tea? You, you probably can't reach the kettle because your feet are... Put kettle on. <laughs> Spoken like a true Yorkshireman. <laughs> yes, you do. I have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one. Okay, yeah. So what, you don't see a solicitor... Um, I mean, you'd probably just ask to be set free, wouldn't you? Um, at least ask for something to eat you know, while I'm here. Um, anyway, how about doing some um, prayer and worship? Ideal. What an opportunity. You've got a captive audience. <laughs> so there we go. They started singing and worshipping. What else could they do? Remember the example of King Jehoshaphat. A vast army is coming upon him. What does he do? Read the story in 2 Chronicles 20. Uh, or listen to any of my previous sermons, pretty much. He resolved to do what God did. God... Oh, I'll start that sentence again. He resolved to ask God what to do. And he does in prayer. And his prayer concludes, We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Jehoshaphat heard God promise that they didn't need to fight. So he called out the priests to lead the people in worship. So mindful of that kind of history, um, oh, here we are, we're locked up. Let's worship God. Let's worship. And then an earthquake. There's something special about this earthquake. This earthquake was just right. All the doors were flung open and all their chains fell off. There's no report of falling masonry. There's no report of anyone getting hurt. Um, 
it was a, that's just the right amount of earthquake. A bit more, building comes down, prisoners are all crushed. A bit less, hmm, that was a bit of a tremble. So very, very skillful earthquake, the power of God at work. And after Paul and Silas had their chains removed, and the doors burst open, it's the jailer's turn. He's in trouble. He's in big trouble. Because he can point to the uh, he can point to the open gates and the broken chains and say to the to the authorities, it was an earthquake. I go, yeah, where's the fallen masonry? Because it wouldn't have been a very big earthquake, it'd be quite localized. So he was in trouble. It looked like the prisoners had escaped, and so he comes in resolved to end his own life. Because if he didn't, and he'd let all his prisoners escape, the authorities would kind of deal with that for him anyway. And so he, he rushes in with a sword ready to end his own life. And do you know what? I've got things wrong at work. I'm sure many of you have. But that does sound quite drastic. And he must have been worried about the consequences. I hope none of you have been worried about the consequences at your workplace, that they're not that severe. And Paul calls on the jailer, don't do that, don't do that. We're all still here. We're all still here, not just Paul and Silas, the other prisoners have gone, well, we'll stick around for the singing, this is good. They're all still there. You're in prison, you're in chains, you're having a bit of a song, maybe singing one of the songs we did today, just kind of, you know, enjoying it. And then your chains fall off, the door bursts open, and you think, I'm going to risk, no, I'll stay, I'll stay. Odd, isn't it, that you wouldn't just kind of think, well, okay, the Lord has freed us. That was clearly God's, you know, Paul would know that that was God's doing. And would he not think, well, the, my chains are gone, my heart was free. <laughs> yeah, now they can reach the kettle, thanks to you. <laughs> You'd think maybe leaving was an option. But none of them left. Paul and Silas stay where they are, so did everyone else. Because God had not said to them that they could leave. And the jailer says this question which echoes down the ages. What must I do to be saved? That is the question that we want people to ask. That is the question that every non-believer you've ever encountered, don't you just wish they'd asked that? Not just, where's the kettle? <laughs> but... You know, wouldn't it be lovely if people came up to you as we leave church and say, what must I do to be saved? Well, you should have turned up at the past 10, really. <laughs> what must I do to be saved? That is such a great question. Why did he need to, why did he realise that he needed to be saved? What was it that made him realise? I mean, yesterday he was just an ordinary jailer going about his jailing um, and... Uh, and he wasn't asking yesterday. He didn't ask the night before when he locked them up. He didn't say, oh, by the way, now I'm locking you up. Um, what must I do to be saved? And maybe it was the example of their worship. He could hear them praising God. Was he thinking, well, that's odd. People don't usually sing songs of praise when I lock them up. They usually say things more like, ow. And these chains are a bit tight. So maybe it was hearing the prayers, hearing their worship. Or maybe it was the power of God in an earthquake. Maybe he discerned that something's going on here. And I guess every one of us has at some point come to that question of what must I do to be saved? And maybe it was the faithful prayers and the worship of someone who believes, maybe a, maybe a family member or maybe a church nearby, or maybe it was somebody... Uh, a friend from college or whatever it was, but in some circumstance of life, you saw something or somebody and thought, what do I need to do to be saved? And maybe you asked the question. Maybe you just went, drew alongside them and went to church for a while and figured it out. Maybe you needed an earthquake. Maybe some of you needed an earthquake to really shake you up. I probably did. Shocked. Surely not. The most important question a person can ask, what must I do to be saved? Do we have 
an answer ready. When somebody says, GJ, what do I need to do to be saved? Sheila, what do I need to do to be saved? What would you say? What's the church said over the course of history? The church has had some answers to that. Obey the Ten Commandments. That's one of the answers. You must obey the Ten Commandments. And the laws of the church. Let's come to church and be disciplined. Do all the things we tell you. That's the thing that the church has said. Behave properly. In just come to church, be there on time, kneel down, sit, stand, kneel, stand, sit, kneel. Um, that's, that's something the church has said. Maybe you need to give. Maybe the church says you need to give. You need to tithe or more to the church. Obviously not just generally to people who need it. Maybe you need to conform to the pattern of the church. But the church has given all those answers over the course of history. And I don't think they're great answers. They're not Paul's answer. What do I need to do to be saved? What does Paul say? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Just a little aside, that you and your household isn't a, if you believe, you and your household be saved. It's believe, you and your household, and you and your household will be saved. There isn't a kind of a, a, a kind of an associated saving status. Where you're gonna, have you been saved? Uh, well, because of my dad, yeah. So my dad was saved years ago, so all of us are, we're fine, thanks. Um, it's not saying that, we can unpack that any time. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. To be fair to the jailer and the family, Really very few people in Philippi were believers at the time. Paul and Silas had not long arrived, as we know, and they'd met one believer that's mentioned, and a few friends maybe, Lydia, who was a seller of purple cloth, if you must know, and her household. They'd kind of been thrown into jail really before getting much further. So believe in the Lord Jesus may not have meant a great deal to the jailer. And so Paul and Silas... Uh, the Bible says to us, spoke the word of the Lord to him and his family. So we have to know, what does it mean to speak the word of the Lord to someone? The answer, my friends, you know this, is found right at the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not put it out. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Speaking the word of the Lord to someone means telling them what Jesus has done for them his death and his resurrection, so they can confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God has raised him from the dead so that they can be saved. So what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. The jailer didn't really know what that meant and I think an awful lot of people today don't know what that means. Of itself, it's not a big enough answer. So many people today will not know that. And so we need to be ready day in and day out to show and to share what the word of the Lord is. What happened next? At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. That's lovely, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, I've had a bit of practice at wound care and I've got to be honest, washing them earlier would have been better. You know, you're less likely to get infected if you wash them before you put them in jail. Um, but I don't think preventing infection was particularly, or caring for them was a, uh, a major concern at that point. But even so, we get to this point and the jailer says, let's go and wash your wounds. Come down to the river. And so he washed their wounds and immediately he and all his household were baptized. I mean, they must have all gone to wash their wounds. And they're in the river, you know, giving a, <laughs> giving a rub down to all those beating marks. Oh, there's a nasty wound here. Let's chuck some river water on it. Uh, but, you know, they washed his wounds. 
And all of them said, can we be baptized then? And Paul and Silas go for it. And the jailer brings them to his house and sets a meal before them, filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. Are you filled with joy that you've come to believe in God? Yeah, reasonably filled with joy. <laughs> filled? Seriously? Are you filled? Let's be filled with joy. That's how much God has on offer. He doesn't say, well, I could just give you a little bit if you like. Joy, God is in the business of filling. And filling us with joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit. And part of what God will do in our lives and let's be joyful about it. This jailer was joyful. This jailer had just had a couple of the people uh, that he was supposed to stop escaping stay in his house. He probably knew in the background that there might still be some trouble coming. But he was filled with joy. After hearing the word of the Lord, the jailer and the family took them and washed their wounds. They were baptized and they went into the house to eat. Filled with joy. Well, our story is nearly at an end. But remember, Paul and Silas were supposed to be in prison still. And the jailer should, by rights, have been in a bit of bother. But that doesn't really give God room. And God will take his room and do what he wants. So what happens next? When it was daylight, the authorities, the jailer has to stay, be up all night, kind of looking after his prisoners. The authorities go home to bed at night. That's just how it is. That hasn't changed. The authorities, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release these men. And the jailer said to Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. After all that had happened, Paul and Silas were released by the authorities and went on their way to meet up with Lydia uh, in her home with her family and to continue their, uh, their work of bringing the word of God to people. And the jailer wasn't in any trouble because they were released anyway. And there is a footnote to all of that, which we'll go into some other time to focus on what I've been speaking about today as I close. Through our worship and our prayers, people will be led by the Holy Spirit to see their need to be saved. That's what the Bible says, is the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, shows us that we have a need. The Ten Commandments can do that. They can't save anyone, but they can show how far we fall from what God requires. We are convicted by the Holy Spirit, and so is everyone else, and they come to see their need to be saved. If we are faithful in sharing the word of God with Jesus, that is Jesus, we share the word of God with these people, they have the opportunity to believe and be saved. Some will take that opportunity, some may not. And I don't believe that it is our responsibility to make that determination, but I do believe it is our responsibility to say, you must believe in Jesus and let me tell you about him shall we pray Lord we're so grateful for this story it just drops in a few little points that are so illuminating for us I thank you that we have the example of Paul and Silas seized unjustly beaten mercilessly and locked up and yet whatever their circumstances of life their trust was in you and so they worshipped you and praised you oh that we'd be able to do the same in the, in the most difficult times of our lives that we turn and pray and worship and in doing that people around us will go what's going on what must I do need to do what must I do to be saved and so we can share. 
the love of God. We want to share the good news that Jesus has died for our sin and has risen again. Risen, ascended and glorified. That all men and women might see him and choose life. Amen. Amen.